Ahoy friends, I just had a bowl of the Hot Kettle Cafe's world famous clam chowder and I'm ready to discuss another Nancy Drew book versus game with you. I think the premise of this series is pretty self-explanatory and if you're watching this you've probably seen my other book versus game videos, but just in case you disagree with both those statements. A lot of the Nancy Drew video games are based on books, and for the past couple of years I've been making a project out of reading those books and reporting back on the similarities and differences between them and the games. Today, Danger on Deception Island is in the hot spot, and I will be spoiling both the game and the book, so be warned. This is the first Nancy Drew book I've discussed, which has a significantly different name than the game inspired by it. The book is titled Whispers in the Fog and was published in 2000, with the game Danger on Deception Island following in 2002, which is also, I believe, the shortest gap between a book and its game adaptation so far. On the cover, we see Nancy doing some epic kayaking with a vaguely formed second person hanging out in the background. On the rugged California coast, Nancy embarks on a deadly voyage. Well, there we go, we've already found a difference. This book is set in California, not Washington. The change makes a lot of sense. Her Interactive had already made a game based in California, and their headquarters was in Seattle, so they could more easily draw upon their familiar surroundings. In my opinion, this was a fantastic choice, as the atmosphere in Danger on Deception Island is so strong and palpable. When you play the game, you really feel you're there, which I'm sure is in part due to the development team's familiarity with the setting. Now, a portion of the video, which I like to call reading the back of the book, reading the synopsis. It's great, it's a great section. Guess what I do in it? Katie Firestone, champion kayaker and owner of a whale watching tour boat, has invited George along with Nancy, Ned, and Bess to vacation in Seabreak, north of San Francisco. But when Katie's boat is vandalized, suspicion falls on fisherman Halt Scotto, who may be trying to run Katie out of business. The menace doesn't stop there, a bike accident, a stalker, danger at an abandoned lighthouse, and a terrifying kayak trip lead Nancy to a hidden sea cave. Inside, Nancy discovers a dangerous secret. Soon her fearless instincts plunge her deeper into trouble, and it will take all her courage, daring, and wits to get herself and her friends out of it alive. This is a good Nancy Drew book, but it pales in comparison to Danger on Deception Island because Danger on Deception Island is a practically perfect Nancy Drew game. Okay, without further ado, let's dive right in. Get it? Because whales dive in the ocean and whales are what this book is about. Dear Ned, here I am on a ferry bound for Deception Island, one of the San Juan Islands off the coast of Washington State. The book starts with Nancy arriving at Katie Firestone's house, accompanied by Bess, George, and, unfortunately, Ned. Anytime her interactive removes Ned from the narrative, it's an instant improvement, in my book. Katie is described as being an attractive 20-year-old with brown hair and an athlete's body, tall, lithe, and strong. Her primary passion is sea kayaking, and whale watching is just her side hustle to help fund her kayaking obsession. Making Katie more concerned with her whale watching business in the game really raises the stakes, because it means a lot more to Katie to risk losing it to a bunch of whale-hating sadists. But you know what else Katie loves? Biking. This girl is booked and busy. You couldn't tell her to get a hobby, because she's already got enough hobbies for three people. She offers to lend the group some of her bikes while they're visiting. I've even got a couple of men's bikes I keep for friends. Okay, Katie, get it. <laughs> the group go to a beach for a picnic where they eat sandwiches. What did you put in that thing? I just go easy on the salmonella this time. Oh, suddenly I don't feel so good. Hopefully not with jellyfish in them. Nancy stops to admire a tide pool while Katie tells everyone, Jenna is due tomorrow. Jenna Deblin. She's coming down from Seattle to train with us. These books really do feel like alternate universes sometimes, where like Nancy stepped on a butterfly and suddenly Jenna Deblin is a professional sea kayaker instead of selling world famous clam chowder. Katie also reveals that she's thinking of quitting the whale watching business. Someone's trying to force me out of business. I've gotten anonymous notes, threatening phone calls. It's driving me nuts. This is a very small town. It's been a sleepy little fishing village for over a century. 
That means many generations of fishermen, Nancy guessed. And they're pretty protective of their territory, I'll bet. You've got it, Katie said with a nod. They believe they've inherited these waters for their family trade, and they're not thrilled to be sharing their territory with an outsider like me. After all, I've only been here five years. Ironic because in the game, Halt has only lived in Snake Horse Harbor for 11 years himself. They think taking the boat of Taurus out for a day's excursion disrupts the waters and cuts down on their catch. Nancy asks Katie if she has any suspects in particular, and Katie says, There's a third generation local named Halt Scotto. He's sort of the leader of the fishermen. He has the biggest boat, and seems to be the one who makes all the decisions. Size matters. In the boating world, at least. It's all just a big deck-measuring contest. Nancy can help, George said. She's a world-famous detective. But at a massive blow to Nancy's ego, Katie says no and turns down Nancy's offer to help. I don't think anyone's said no to Nancy before. This must be an entirely new feeling for her. You know, rejection. Now she must know exactly how Ned feels all the time. They head back to Katie's and go to her boathouse to see her boat, which in the book is called Ripper. Orchestra is a miles better boat name, both because it's a fantastic pun and also because it doesn't sound like it's about to hunt you down and eat you in the most violent manner possible. Then shock, horror, Katie's boat has been trashed. I or can't believe it. I would like to deeply, earnestly, sincerely apologize for that pun and any psychic damage it might have caused. Anyway, Katie's boat is an absolute mess. Cupboards were splintered with the remaining pieces dangling from broken hinges. Napkins, spoons, and bananas littered the floor. This is bananas! I would like to deeply, earnestly, and sincerely apologize. The good news is that Katie has already had a character arc and realizes that she needs help and asks Nancy to investigate. The one clue Nancy finds is a business card, not for Whale World, but for a place called Lone Motel. Nancy, Bess, and Ned drive into town, which in the book is not called a Snake Horse Harbor, but Seabreak. Seabreak is one of the tiny towns dotting the coastal bluffs from San Francisco north to the Oregon border. It had old wooden frame houses with small lawns, a tiny bakery, a bare essentials grocery store. There were no tourist souvenir shops, not even a gas station. What this place needs is a cozy cafe which serves world famous clam chowder. Nancy lightly questions a few fishermen and the waitress at the diner, but they're all pretty unfriendly and don't volunteer much information. Defeated, the gang heads back to the inn they're staying at. They're just settling in when, hey, a booming voice exploded like a cannon from the hall outside their door. Nancy's pulse seemed to beat in rhythm to the pounding on the door and the whole room seemed to shake. Hey, the man yelled again. Are you in there? Open this door, now. Bess looked at Nancy, her eyes wide with apprehension. Who could that be, she whispered. Nancy, what'll we do? Nancy felt a shudder tumble through her as she held her hand up to Bess. As she walked toward the door, she heard Ned's voice in the hall. Cool down, Ned said from the other side of the door. Who are you? What do you want? I'm Holt Scotto. That's who? The words blasted through the door. Nancy reached for the knob and opened the door. Scotto was tall, with short hair bleached straw blonde by the sun, and a small gold hoop in one ear. Wait, 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 wait. pause for a sec, pause for a sec. I have, I have one, one question. Is it the gay ear? Is Halt Scotto a homosexual? Ned stepped between them in the doorway. With one sweep of his beefy arm, Scotto pushed Ned aside and continued to glare at Nancy. Love seeing Ned get pushed around and having his masculinity threatened by beefier men. Halt wants to know why Nancy's been asking questions around town. He says, You quit poking around. I'm not warning you again. If you mess with me, you'll be sorry. That does it, Ned said, stepping towards Scotto. Back off. For a moment, it looked as if Scotto might hit Ned. But unfortunately, he doesn't. The next day, the group plans to go out kayaking and meet up at Katie's place. Katie gets a phone call from Andy Jason, who wants Katie to either work for him or go out of business. Basically, if he can't have her, 
nobody can. Then Nancy accuses Ned of having a one-track mind, because all he can think about is big decks- oh, sorry, kayaking. But it's not quite time to go kayaking yet. First, Nancy and Bess go visit Andy's whale-watching establishment. A boat-shaped building topped with a colorful sign. See migrating whales up close, the sign read. Finest fleet afloat. Andy Jason Owner. Sea Migrating Whales Up Close, Finest Fleet Afloat, Andy Jason Owner is not quite as catchy a name for a whale watching business as Whale World. Are you impressed that I said Finest Fleet Afloat first try multiple times? Because I am. Nancy, for some incomprehensible reason, decides to pretend she's a reporter named Linny Lowell and that Bess is a photographer named Jane Cloud. Maybe she's practicing for her improv group? Nancy definitely strikes me as a potential theater kid. They meet Andy Jason, a slim man in a navy blazer with brass buttons. He looked as if he was in his mid-thirties. He was of medium height, with brown hair and a neatly trimmed beard and mustache. Nancy pretends to interview him and casually brings the subject around to Katie. Is she going out of business? One way or the other, Andy muttered in a low voice. Characters in mystery novels just love casually implicating themselves in crimes. As the two girls are driving back to Seabreak, Bess spots an old lighthouse and they stop to take a look. Part of a metal staircase that wound around the outside of the lighthouse had pulled away and drooped precariously above them. The lighthouse was surrounded by a metal fence. Come on, Bess said. She ducked under a huge yellow sign reading Keep Out through a large hole in the fence and up to the lighthouse door. Wait, Bess? The same Bess who's usually like, Little Nancy, I wanna go home. There are ghosts and mean men about, maybe even mean men. Ghosts, I'm really scared of them. In fact, I'm scared of everything. I don't know if it's the sea air that's giving her the bravado or what. Maybe it's just that the ghostwriter didn't read the character manual properly, but either way, I'm here for it. Trespass a little is a treat to break that law. You go, girl. There's a small closet. A low shuffling sound rustled from under the door. Nancy picked up a piece of driftwood and crept to the closet door. As she neared it, the sound behind the door became louder, more urgent. Holding the driftwood firmly with one hand, she grasped the knob with the other. Bess stood close behind her, holding a large rock she'd found on the lighthouse floor. I love that in these books, when faced with a potential threat, these teen girls just revert to their inner cave people and pick up the nearest big rock and big stick to defend themselves with. Nancy opens the closet door, and you'll never guess what's inside. A seagull. Yikes, Bess cried. I was really scared for a minute. Okay, yeah, that was short-lived. Bess is back to her usual cowardly self, afraid of a little seagull. When the girls go to leave, they discover that they've been locked in. They eventually manage to push the door open and discover that someone stacked a pile of rocks outside the door while they were inside. Back at Katie's house, Jenna Devlin has arrived. She had an athletic body and medium blonde hair that shone with pale streaks from the sun. Jenna is the character who probably changes the most between the book and the game. In the game, if not actually indigenous, she is at the very least indigenous coded and definitely not white, unless she's dangerously addicted to tanning to compensate for the lack of sun in the Pacific Northwest. Additionally, in the game, her identity isn't worryingly tied to her career as a professional kayaker, and she has the top secret recipe for world-famous clam chowder, so I think Game Jenner is just doing better all around. Even if she is having to deal with the weight of her ancestors luring people with world-famous clam chowder and then kidnapping them. Later, Ned, Bess, Nancy, and George go to the diner for a soda. Just doesn't hit the spot in the same way that world-famous clam chowder does. A woman was speaking at the front of the room. She looked about 45 years old and had straight dark hair and glasses with gold wire frames. My name is Joan Kim, the woman announced. I own a small fleet of fishing boats up the coast. I've been told you're having some problems with a whale watching business down here. Miss Kim goes on to give an impassioned speech about banding together to get rid of the evil whale watching companies who, if they go unchecked, will bankrupt the fishermen 
drive them from their homes, and probably f their wives while they're at it. Beware the corrupting influence of whale watchers. If we don't stop these whale watchers, we'll be living in a whale dictatorship faster than you can say Cadborosaurus. Whales rule, yeah, with an iron fist. What kind of campaign are you talking about, a woman asked. Nothing fatal, Miss Kim added with a laugh. And nothing strictly illegal, but there are things you can do to intimidate outsiders and discourage them from staying. Everyone is just willfully choosing to ignore that Ms. Kim is an outsider herself, including Ms. Kim. And not just literally in the book, she's an outsider in the game too, as she doesn't appear in any form in Danger on Deception Island. Suddenly, everyone inside the diner seems to realize there's a group of outsiders in their midst. Hey, it's those outsiders that was asking questions last night, one of the fishermen yelled from across the diner. They got no business being here, a woman shouted. Get him out! Several people came over to Nancy's booth. Nancy stood, saying, We're not here to make trouble. We stopped in for sodas, that's all. Ned, Bess, and George slid out of the booth and followed Nancy to the door. Nancy could feel the waves of anger and fear that filled the room. She knew they had to leave. This book came very close to being titled Nancy Drew, Danger of Mob Violence. Once outside, Ned asks, who is Joan Kim? Which is exactly what I was wondering at this point in the story too. Actually, my question was more like, who the f is Joan Kim? But a character in a children's book wouldn't phrase it exactly like that. They start to bike home. However, Bess is riding Katie's bike and she encounters a problem. Whoa, Bess called. Hey, there's something wrong with my bike. It's wobbling and a nasty snap of metal cut off Bess's words, then her cry pierced the fog. Bess's bike seemed to fly apart. Horrified, Nancy watched Bess barrel into Ned, somersaulting over his back wheel and landing with a horrible scraping skid on the side of the road. Bess landed in the dirt. She didn't move or cry out. I sure hope she was wearing a helmet. Bess has a broken wrist, but is otherwise okay, and Nancy discovers that the damage to Katie's bike was intentional. At the clinic, Nancy and Ned run into Andy, who is still under the impression that Nancy is a reporter named Linny Lowell, which in fact he will be for the entirety of the book. Nancy introduces Ned as Ned Nordstrom, digging herself deeper into her hole of lies. Andy is suspicious that they're at the clinic with Katie, even though Nancy explained that Katie apparently drove by as Bess, sorry, Jane, fell and offered them a ride to the clinic. Back at the inn, Nancy discovers a note in her and Bess's room. So sorry your friend got hurt, but it's your fault. This is just the beginning unless you back off and stay out of things that are none of your business. Nancy wonders how someone could have known about Bess's accident so soon after it happened to leave the note. The next day, the group finally decide to go out kayaking, which is something that Jenna is very excited about. It's time to forget all this detective stuff and get on with our real mission in life. Sea kayaking! At the beach, Nancy spots something. A huge wave was roaring toward the shore. Unaware, Jenna, her back to the ocean, was adjusting the helmet around her ears. Nancy ran faster, but she was too late. No one could reach Jenna in time. Helpless, Nancy watched the wave fold over the beach and crash. When the foam and water retreated, Jenna was gone. This is a scene literally taken out of my nightmares. The first and most vivid nightmare I can remember is of my whole family being dragged out to sea by a wave. I did not expect to be confronted by one of my greatest childhood fears while reading a Nancy Drew book. The others spring into action, grabbing their kayaks and heading out into the waves. Luckily, they won't be permanently waving goodbye to Jenna because soon they spot her helmet. Another reason why it's important to wear one, you're easier to spot in the water after a wave drags you out to sea. They rescue Jenna, who shockingly is ready to get right back out there. I've had quite a few surf spills in my career, but that was one of the worst, Jenna said, glowering at Katie. And you're gonna pay for it too, she added, 
with the hardest workout you've ever had. To start with, you can pull me back to shore to get my kayak. Am I sensing a little something here between Katie and Jenna? Or is it just confirmation bias of my headcanon that Katie and Jenna are ex-girlfriends in Danger on Deception Island? Nancy and Ned break off from the rest of the group, and Ned says, How about a race? I'll give you a two-minute head start. You're on, Nancy said, and you'll be sorry you gave me any time at all. Shut up, Ned, you condescending, misogynist piece of flattened cardboard. Nancy does not need a head start in a race against you. She would win in any category of race. Nancy, of course, easily passes Ned, but soon finds herself getting pulled by the current. With one giant surge, Nancy and her kayak were flung into a dark sea cave. Yeah, that's right. I know you're all jumping to your feet, hooting and hollering right now like your team just scored the big goal. It's sea cave time! The cave had been dug into the huge rock tower that rose up from the ocean floor and arched high over the water's surface. Over centuries, the sea had hollowed out the rock into a long, dark grotto. That's a good word that you don't see often enough. Grotto. A few columns of light filtered down through holes in the high ceiling of the cave. Nancy's kayak was tangled in webs of kelp that had been swept into the cave with her. The water inside the cave was calm and dark, but it was periodically flushed by a wave of foam. However, we don't get much time to savor these quiet moments without Ned, as he soon rejoins Nancy in the cave, accompanied by George. George, Nancy said, what are you doing here? The last time I saw you, you were way out with Katie and Jenna. Yeah, well, it wasn't much fun, George replied. They have a real competitive thing going on. I mean, they are ferocious. There's no way I could keep up. I am eating up any and all information about Katie and Jenna's toxic situationship like it's a bowl of the Hot Kettle Cafe's world-famous clam chowder. And boy, it's good eating. Nancy, George, and Ned explore the cave, and Nancy finds something. It was a silver belt buckle in the shape of a horse's head with a windswept mane. Very cool, George said. I completely agree, George. I would wear that any day of the week. But now we know our culprit is a horse girl, which doesn't really narrow down our list of suspects. Like, if Andy Jason wasn't such a whale boy, he would 100% be a horse girl. I bet he has a secret pack of being super competitive in dressage competitions. The trio continue to look around the cave. Nancy heard an odd sound. It was almost like a whisper echoing around the walls of the cave. Did you hear that? She asked, her voice hushed as she listened. What? I didn't hear anything, Ned said. He sounded a little impatient. You know what? I'm ready to get out of here. God, Ned is boring. This is just confirmation of what we already know, that he has almost zero sense of adventure. As Nancy drifted, she heard the sound again. A low whisper floated through the fog. Hey, that's the title! They said the title! Well, pretty much. Close enough. I'm not hearing anything but my stomach growling, Ned said. I'm getting out of this place. Ned, please shut up, challenge. However, Nancy demonstrates a powerful lesson for all girls and women out there. She doesn't listen to the man trying to deny her feelings and instead follows her gut. The soft whisper came closer and closer. Then something large and dark slowly broke the surface, and one huge eye stared straight at her. Nancy held her breath as she stared back at the large eye. Fog broke, and she could see the source of the sad-sounding whispers and moans. A small whale stared right at her from some sort of holding pool. A whale, Ned said. It's a whale. Thanks for that, Ned. Very insightful. They leave the whale to reunite with Katie and Jenna and discover that they've come out in a different location. They're forced to bring their kayaks up to shore and continue on foot along the beach. They ran out of sandy beach and had to cross over large flat rocks, jumping from one to the other. Ned, Nancy, and George eventually reunite with the others and they all go check out a nearby souvenir shop. On the wall, there are pictures of various celebrities who've come to visit the shop. As Nancy neared a display of accessories, her heart skipped a beat. One particular item attracted her with its silvery gleam. It was a navy blue patent leather belt 
with a silver horse's head buckle, and it was exactly like the buckle that she had tugged from the rocky wall of the sea cave. The shopkeeper notices Nancy looking and mentions that someone bought a similar belt buckle recently. The shopkeeper guided Nancy over to the wall of photographs. Let me see, was that one bought by a celebrity? Hmm, no, there it is. I don't recognize her as anybody, do you? Shopkeeper pointed to a photograph. The woman in the photo wearing the horse's head buckle was Joan Kim. Awfully convenient of her to just put up pictures of random people who've bought things in her shop as well as celebrities. Unless none of those people are celebrities and she's just trying to convince people her shop is a hot spot for the stars for clout. Anyway, Joan Kim is revealed as the secret horse girl. The next day, the sheriff takes Halton for questioning in regards to Bess's biking accident and Nancy and Ned are invited along to participate for some reason. I'm not sure that's correct police procedure, but I'll ignore it for plot reasons. I suppose they think I did it, Scotto said, flopping his long arm out to point at Ned and Nancy. Well, that's nuts, he said fiercely. I never did any of those things. Did you pile the rocks outside the door of that abandoned lighthouse down the coast? Nancy asked, and barricade my friend and me inside? Scotto looked up quickly, his eyes glaring at Nancy. He sputtered for a few minutes, then declared, Yes, yes, I did, and I'd do it again, just the same. He turned to the sheriff. I'd like to file a complaint, he said, against her. He pointed at Nancy again. She was trespassing, he continued entering private property and walking around and all, arrest her. Halt really throwing the Uno reverse card down onto the table. I am going to jail? Actually, I think you'll find that you're going to jail. The sheriff eventually ends the interview by telling Nancy and Halt to stay away from each other. I bet he's sick of dealing with the childish bickering between a hot-headed Republican fisherman and an interfering amateur teen detective about which one of them is guilty of various miscellaneous crimes. Bess does some research and discovers that the sea cave is owned by a company named Shore Imports Inc. That's shore like ocean shore. That shore is a lame pun. And guess who's the president of Shore Imports Inc? The one and only closet cowgirl, Joan Kim, who's now been outed both for her passion for ponies and for owning a sketchy company which is both an offshore company and a shore company. Nancy and the Drew crew take out Katie's boat to check on the baby whale, but it's gone. When they leave the cave, they see something. Nancy was stunned to see a huge ship apparently anchored about 500 yards out in the harbor. It looks like some sort of freighter, she suggested. Because of the rocks in the sea and the enormous bluff, the ship was probably not visible from any road. I'll bet this is a private harbor for Joan Kim's outfit, Nancy guessed. I think we need to check out that ship. Nancy steers the ripper towards the freighter, but then she felt a searing pain on the back of her head. Her knees felt like melted gelatin, and the blood all seemed to rush from her head. The last thing she heard as she crumbled to the floor was a plaintive, unearthly moan. This really makes this sound like this was attempted murder by the whale. When Nancy wakes up, she, Bess, and Ned are tied up and being held captive on the freighter. It was two men, Bess said in a hushed voice. They just appeared over the railing of the deck. They must have approached in a raft or rubber boat, Nancy said. I never heard a thing. Neither did I or Ned, Bess whispered. They just overpowered us. Ned put up quite a fight, but they hit him with a wrench. I tried to call out but one of them had his hand over my mouth. So Nancy just didn't hear her boyfriend getting smacked on the head with a wrench? Nancy's really the one in the relationship with a one-track mind. Ned's mind, on the other hand, doesn't have any tracks at all. Oh, groaned Ned from the corner of the small room. Ooh, shush, Bess and Nancy both hushed Ned. Glad to see Nancy and Bess are also participating in the Ned Please Shut Up challenge. They manage to get their bindings undone and creep around the ship. Nancy gets separated from Bess and Ned and enters a room only to find herself face to face with Joan Kim. Ms. Drew, the tall, attractive woman said. She was dressed in a purple silk jumpsuit. She may have kidnapped three teenagers and a poor little baby whale, but no one can say she wasn't serving while she did it. But soon she'll be serving more than just c***. She'll be serving an extended prison sentence. 
turns out they're in the ship's dining room, and there's a window behind Joan Kim. In the window, Nancy can see that Joan is holding a gun behind her back. Joan explains her evil plot. I own ships around the world and capture whale calves to sell to our clients. What do your clients do with them, Nancy asked. Not sure she wanted to hear the answer. It's not my concern, Kim said with an offhand gesture. Some are put in zoos or films or other such attractions. Some are probably eaten. This book has surprisingly taken a much darker turn than the game. And he just wanted to use the whale to pilfer sunken treasure, which feels like baby's first crime, in comparison to illegally selling baby whales to be made into whale nuggets. While Joan talks, Nancy grabs a pepper shaker from one of the tables and holds it behind her. Nancy has brought a pepper shaker to a gunfight. Can't wait to see how that turns out for her. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. And you sawed the axle on Bess's bike too, right? Nancy said, and vandalized Katie's boat. The woman seemed taken aback. Bicycle axle, she repeated. I know nothing about that. And I did nothing to Miss Firestone's boat. I considered it, but someone beat me to it. So it looks like the book has two culprits, but we don't know who the second one is yet. Then Nancy mentions the horse-shaped belt buckle. Joan Kim's expression softened immediately. My buckle? Where did you find it? It's one of my favorite pieces. Give it back to me now. I love the villain just kind of forgetting the situation she's in because she loves her belt buckle so f much. If I was her, I would just shoot Nancy and take it off her dead body, but Joan Kim doesn't think smart not hard like I do. Keeping the pepper shaker under her sweater, Nancy pulled her hand around to the front. With both hands under her sweater, she pretended to be unbuckling a belt. Then with one quick sure gesture, she pulled the shaker out from under her sweater and, leaning forward, dashed the contents in Joan Kim's face. Then Nancy reached back immediately and grabbed a candlestick from the table. What? What have you done? Her left arm came out from behind her back, but her eyes were clenched tightly against the pepper. Nancy was ready for her, slamming the candlestick into the woman's arm with a solid blow. The gun flew across the room, landing in a soft easy chair in the far corner. Joan Kim doubled over, her left arm hung limp, her right hand swiped frantically at the pepper dust on her face. As Nancy grabbed her arms, the woman tried to fight, but she was stunned by the pepper. Tears rippled out from her eyelids and rolled in streaky patterns down the black and gray speckles covering her cheeks. Her nose ran and she tried to yell for help, but with every breath she inhaled more pepper. The only sounds that came out were gagged squeaks and coughing spasms. Within minutes, Nancy had tied Joan Kim to a heavy radiator against the wall. She tied the bandana around her mouth as a gag. She didn't pull it too tight because the woman was still having trouble breathing. Absolutely brutal. Well, she's proven conclusively that the pepper shaker is mightier than the gun. Then Nancy, after breaking a woman's arm and probably giving her permanent respiratory issues, casually pockets the gun and strolls out of the room. Nancy has the makings of a cold-hearted criminal. We're so fortunate that she's chosen to use her powers for good. She then summons the Coast Guard with a flare, and they rescue Nancy and her friends and arrest Joan Kim. Then the gang go out for a seafood dinner. Nancy, I can't thank you enough for solving the case, Katie said. I can finally do my cruises and not worry about harassment. Or worse. I appreciate your thanks, Nancy said, but I'm not convinced the case is totally solved. We still don't know who trashed the Ripper and who tampered with the bike. I still don't like Andy Jason, George said. What about him? I haven't ruled him out, Nancy said, but he doesn't really seem to be trying to run Katie out of business. He seems to want to work with her. It doesn't make sense that he'd try to hurt her, like with the bike accident. Then Nancy gets talking to George about Katie and Jenna. Katie told me some stuff that explains why they go at each other so hard, George said, lowering her voice. They've got a kind of history together. Jenna was a regular world team member until Katie came along. Katie was so good that she was moved into Jenna's place on the team, and Jenna became an alternate. So Jenna's trying to get back on the team, and Katie's trying to hold on to her place, Nancy concluded. No wonder their workouts are so tough. I'm amazed they even speak to each other. Katie says the team comes first, George said. That's why she invited Jenna down. 
will help them get along better and keep the peace. Enemies to lovers arc? Nancy figures out that although Jenna said she came to Seabreak directly from Seattle, she actually was, until very recently, staring at a nearby hotel called the Malone Motel a name that fits with the business card Nancy found in Katie's boat. In the meantime, Jenna and Katie have gone out jogging together on the local bluffs, and George and Nancy race over there to find them. While Nancy and George watched, Jenna walked a little farther away, then leaned down and seemed to pick something up. Then she walked in from the bluff's edge a little, until she was out of Katie's line of vision. Nancy could still see her, and she could also see the large cypress branch she held in her hand. In horror, Nancy watched as Jenna crept behind Katie and lifted the large hunk of grey cypress high over Katie's head. Katie, Nancy screamed with all her strength. Katie sat straighter and looked around. She saw Jenna just in time to duck. When Jenna saw Nancy and George approaching, she looked frantically around and then began running away. Nancy and George caught up with Jenna. She dropped to her knees in a dejected heap on the trail and gave in to desperate, draining sobs. Jenna, Katie said. What were you doing? What on earth were you thinking? She wasn't thinking about anything but herself, Nancy explained, and her past glory on the sea kayak team. She's been jealous of you for a long time, George added. You knew that, Katie. Yes, but I didn't think she'd go this far, Katie said. That's right, in the book, Jenna is responsible for sabotaging Katie's boat like a toddler throwing a tantrum, all because Katie is better at kayaking than her. So it's not an enemies to lovers arc, it's an enemies to even worse enemies arc. Jenna confesses, In the middle of the night, Monday, I went aboard the Ripper and ripped it, George said in a disgusted voice. Okay, so they named the boat the Ripper just so they could make that one pun. I get it. Katie said, why? Why would you want to ruin my business? It's only fair, Jenna lashed out. You ruined me. You took away the only thing I ever wanted, a regular spot on the national team. I don't care about your silly old whale watching, but I figured if I disabled your boat, maybe you'd be too distracted to compete. But better yet, maybe you'd have an accident. Nancy got a chill when she saw the nasty look on Jenna's face. How did you figure it out, Nancy? Katie asked. I realized that Jenna was the only person who could have put the note under my door the night Bess fell off the bike, because she was the only one besides us who knew about the accident that quickly. She found out about it when we called you, Katie. You're also the one who cut the axle, aren't you? Nancy asked Jenna. Yes, Jenna hissed. But it was Katie's bike. She was supposed to have the accident. Then Jenna is taken away by the sheriff for her crimes. If she'd just devoted herself to making world-famous clam chowder instead of professional sea kayaking, none of this would have happened. That evening, Nancy, Katie, George, Bess, and Ned fixed a celebration dinner of grilled tuna and homemade fries. I've decided that if Jenna will agree to get counseling, I won't press charges, Katie said. She needs serious help here, not prison. Besides, when the World Kayaking Organization hears about this, she'll be banned for life. That will punish her more than anything, Bess said sadly. Ned laughed out loud as he helped himself to a third helping of fries. What's so funny, Bess asked. I was just thinking about the first time we talked about taking this trip. I knew I'd like the kayaking, but I figured the rest of the time would be a big snooze. Was I ever wrong? You should have known better, Ned, George reminded him. We all know that when we go on vacation with Nancy Drew, we're guaranteed a whale of a good time. I don't think Katie, who was viciously betrayed by someone she thought was a friend, or Bess, who broke her wrist, would say that they had had a whale of a good time, but okay. While, or should I say whale, Katie was having the worst week of her life, George was just live, laugh, loving. Anyway, that's the end of the book. A completely alternate ending to Danger on Deception Island. Andy Jason is guilty of nothing except being obnoxious. He's actually a bit of a victim in this situation as he never finds out that Nancy and Bess are not, in fact, reporters called Linny Lowell and Jane Cloud. And Nancy never faces any repercussions for deceiving him, teaching kids that you can lie about every aspect of your personality with no negative consequences. Dear Ned, I've got to hand it to Andy Jason. The plan he cooked up to recover smuggled animal furs was a darn good one. If you'll permit me to make a comparison, 
Whispers in the Fog is the Dow's porpoise to danger on Deception Island's gray whale. While they're both whales, there's a myriad of differences between them. What I'm trying to say is that although on a surface level the book and the game appear to have quite a few things in common, they're actually very different. For one thing, the characters in Danger on Deception Island are all way nicer to Nancy than they are in Whispers in the Fog. And if you're like, w wait, Chloe, doesn't Halt in the game practically insist on Nancy acing his little seamanship quiz and catching him dinner before she's allowed to even talk to him? Doesn't he say, you again, whenever Nancy approaches him in the most aggrieved manner possible for her daring to disturb him from his very important work of sitting around the hot kettle cafe doing sweet f**k all? And to that I would answer, at least he doesn't threaten to break her hotel room door down so he can physically drag her out of town, or trap her in the lighthouse to starve by piling a load of rocks in front of the door, or campaign to get her arrested, all real things he does in the book. Actually, scratch that last one. In the game, Halt literally sends Nancy to jail if you bring him the wrong type of crab, which is a bit of an overreaction to a teenager who only just learned that crabs can be illegal. In addition, Book Halt is backed up by a gang of fishermen cronies who appear to make up 90% of the population of this small town and hate Nancy on sight. She asks one question, and they act like she's a vile demon that needs to be banished as soon as humanly possible. And at least Andy Jason pretends to be Katie's friend in the game, rather than muttering vague threats under his breath every time time her name is casually brought up in conversation, even though he's not guilty of committing any harmful acts against her. The hostile vibes are as thick and unignorable as sea fog, and there are a lot of fun elements which are unique to the game. Hilda Swenson, Whale World, Cadaverosaurus, the Hot Kettle Cafe and the Tunnels Under Town, the list goes on. Sandwiches are a common denominator in both though, as clearly know sandwiches are a key part of a good life. To summarize, Danger on Deception Island is a game about whales to which kayaking is a side effect, and Whispers in the Fog is a book about kayaking in which whales are a side effect to that porpoise, sorry I mean purpose. I want to leave you with one very important reminder. Whales rule!